Yeah, we were examining the elementary properties of Markov processes and let me continue with that give a little more bit of an introduction to some elementary Markov processes and then we go on to applying uh, whatever we have learned to dynamical systems specifically to coarse grain dynamics. Uh, if you recall I defined the Markov process as one in which the conditional probability for an event to occur at a certain instant of time is dependent only upon the preceding instant of time whatever happened at the preceding instant of time and this short term memory led to the consequence had the consequence that the entire family of probability densities or probabilities for a Markov process are in fact expressible in terms of a single conditional probability and this means that the system is completely known all statistical averages can be found once I give you an equation for this conditional probability or probability density. Okay. In the case of processes in continuous time this probability density obeys a certain master equation and the way we wrote this equation was delta over delta t p of x and t given an initial value x naught was written on the right hand side as equal to an integral over all intermediate states x prime p of x prime t x naught multiplied by the transition probability to go from x prime to x the transition rate to go from x prime to x minus p of x t x naught multiplied by the transition rate to go from x out to x prime okay. and this was like a gain term and that was like a loss term and this is what the master equation read and this thing is called the master equation and I further pointed out that if you took these quantities and wrote these out as some kind of a column vector then you ended up with a matrix equation in the case in which the value of x the values of x were discrete values discrete set of values otherwise it is an integration or replaced by a summation in the case of a discrete set of values. Now this kind of equation is not easy to solve it is a linear equation in P but it is an integral differential equation on this side and it is not altogether trivial to solve it although there are well established techniques now for handling this sort of equation and making considerable progress. Of course the input information has to be this you have to know what these transition rates are to go from one state to another. The same thing if I wrote it out in discrete time for a discrete set of states and let us say the variable x takes on only a discrete set of values x1, x2, x3 etc and let us label that by some integer j and let me say the system is in state j if the variable random variable has a value x sub j. Then I can ask what is the probability that it is in the state j at time n or time n plus 1 what is this equal to this is equal to the probability that at time n the system has reached some state k for example in this case let us put the time index inside because we are going to write this as a matrix equation so p j at time n plus 1 is p k at time n multiplied by the transition rate of making jumps from the state k to the state j per unit time. So in one more step it jumps to this point and in our notation this thing is a summation over k and in our notation this is a transition from k to j the way I have written it from x prime to x I write this as from k to j this is the gain term so this stands for the transition probability from k to j okay. minus p j of n w k j okay. 
So, again this is now the form of a rate equation it really is telling you that here is the gain term which contributes to the probability in state j and this is the loss the rate of loss. And if you write these p j s together as a column matrix then of course this is a matrix equation of the form p is p at time n n plus 1 is equal to some w p at time n and since this is a constant matrix which you are given once and for all the transition rates between the different states it is immediately obvious that p at time n is w to the n p at time 0. So, this at once implies that p at time n is w to the n p at time 0 and all you have to do is to calculate this matrix here. Now the way to calculate the nth power of a matrix for large n if this uh, state space has got some large number of dimensions is not altogether trivial what you do is to try to diagonalize this matrix or at the very least if you cannot diagonalize this matrix at least bring it to Jordan canonical form after which you can take its nth power without too much difficulty. So, this is a problem now in matrix algebra to find out what p n is given any initial distribution p 0. Okay. Let us look at a few examples let us look at an extremely simple example in continuous time just to get used to the idea of these things in continuous time and let us look at an example where the state space just contains it is two dimensional just two possible values. So, we have a variable which switches between two values say x 1 and x 2 at random instants of time and what would this look like if I plotted the graph. So, let us say there are two values x 1 and x 2 so as a function of t I have the variable x and suppose this is the value x 1 and this is the value x 2 just for illustration sake let me take it to be negative it does not matter. So, this is the value x 2 it continues for a while and then flips back to x 1 goes on for a random instant of time back to x 2 for a random instant of time and so on. So, here is state 1 and here is state 2 and there is a certain transition probability or rate per unit time of switching from state 1 to state 2 and let us call that lambda 1. So, lambda 1 so 1 to 2 rate of switching this is lambda 1 and 2 to 1 back again this is lambda 2 in general. And suppose this process goes on for a very long time and now I ask what are these equations what is dp1 over dt equal to and what is dp2 over dt equal to. It is evident that at any instant of time p1 of t plus p2 of t must be equal to 1 the system must be in one of the two states and it flips back and forth between these two states. Now what would this equation be equal to? If the system has reached the state 1 already it makes a transition to 2 with a rate lambda 1 and that is a loss term for p 1. So, that is minus lambda 1 p 1 because they are switching out of 1 into 2 like this and then the gain would be if you switch from 2 back to 1 and that would be plus lambda 2 p 2. On the other hand here for p 2 what would it be here obviously lambda 1 p 1 minus lambda 2 p 2 okay. and this is as it should be because as you see the transition matrix if I write it down is in fact so w in this case this transition matrix is minus lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda 1 minus lambda 2. And as I promised the sum of elements of each column is 0 as you expect and it has the immediate consequence that if I added up p 1 plus p 2 I immediately get as you can see d over d t p 1 plus p 2 equal to 0 which implies that p 1 plus p 2 equal to constant 
equal to 1 if you normalize it initially it remains at 1 for all time. The job of course is to now try to find out what are the steady state properties of this system by this process by the way that it where it flips by Markovian process where it flips between two possible values back and forth is called a dichotomous or dichotomic Markov process very often abbreviated as DMP very popular in modeling in a very large number of situations and it is uh, evident immediately that I can eliminate either P1 or P2 and I am going to get a second order differential equation for either P1 or P2 the same equation in fact and then the solution depends on the initial conditions. So it would the solution would in fact be the sum of two exponentials depending on the eigenvalues of this matrix which are fairly straightforward to write down okay. We can in fact compute e to the wt and write down the full answer you can do this in some simple form but first let me ask this what is the average value of x in this case this is an ongoing process for a very long time so you could ask what would be the equilibrium value what would be the equilibrium value so that is or a stationary value <coughs> equilibrium probability distribution what would that be well exactly as in the case of dynamical systems we essentially have a system which looks like this and in equilibrium this should be 0 in the stationary state. So you want w p to be 0 and if I call that uh, let us call this P1 equilibrium and P2 equilibrium this column vector tells me what the equilibrium distribution is between 1 and 2 what would that be for this process I would have to set this equal to 0 in other words I would have to find a column vector P which is annihilated by W you act with W on the left and you get a null vector because the rows the, the sum of uh, each column is equal to 0 it is evident that the uniform vector is a left Eigen vector with Eigen value 0. So it is evident that if I took this 1 1 and operated with W on this side I get 0 that is because the sum of each column is equal to 0. So what I want is the corresponding ket vector right Eigen vector corresponding to this 0 and that would give me the equilibrium values out there but you can actually guess on physical grounds you can guess what happens here what is the average time that the system spends in state 2 what would this be let us call this tau 2 mean mean residence time in state 2 let us call that tau 2 what would this be what would the mean residence time here be and similarly tau the mean time here would be tau 1 what would this be well it is clear the faster it gets out of that state the less the residence time in that state and if it goes on for a very long time then what you could do is to add up all these intervals and divide by the total time and take the limit in which the total time elapsed goes to infinity and similarly for state 1 and this would give you the relative fractions the fraction of time that the system spends in either state 1 or state 2 over a long interval of time that would be in fact directly proportional to your equilibrium distribution. So what would that be what is tau 2 going to be? exactly it is just what exactly absolutely so this thing here is lambda 2 inverse and this is lambda 1 inverse lambda 1 is a rate at which it switches out of 1 right so lambda 1 inverse is the mean time it spends in state 1 and therefore this p1 equilibrium would be equal to tau 1 over tau 1 plus tau 2 and the other guy is tau 2 over tau 1 plus tau 2. Hmm. 
therefore this is lambda 2 over lambda 1 plus lambda 2 and this other guy is lambda 1 over lambda 1 plus lambda 2. That is physically obvious it is easy to trivial to check that if you took this and wrote down here those column vectors this column vector here with tau 1 is lambda 1 inverse and tau 2 lambda 2 inverse you get 0 on the other side. What would the average value of this process be? What is x average equal to? Well exactly so I would expect this to be x1 tau 1 plus x2 tau 2 over tau 1 plus tau 2 this is what I would expect and that would be equal to lambda 2 x1 plus lambda 1 x2 over expect this to be the average. So it is sitting somewhere here it depends on whether it is closer to this or this would depend on what the transition rates are in general and similarly for the mean mean square and that would just be x1 squared and x2 squared here that is it and you can find the correlation function that is the crucial thing we would like to find out and what do you think that is going to be that is the most important thing of all. So in particular I would like to find the correlation function and let me call this uh, uh, C of t in equilibrium this would be equal to the average value of x minus x average x of 0 minus x average x of t minus x average and the average value of that. That is my definition of the correlation function. And what do you think this is going to be in this process? You can compute this without too much difficulty, but let us see what the ex exact expression for this quantity is, what the actual expression for this is, the formal expression. If I say that the pro so this is equal to if it is a continuous process, for example. I would say this is equal to an integral over the initial value dx0 an integral over the value at time t let me just call it x times the probability that I have x at time t given x0 at time 0 multiplied by the probability that I have x0 at time 0 since it is a stationary process there is no time argument there multiplied by x minus x average times x0 minus x average that is that is the quantity which I want to average over and this is what I average over this probability distribution this is the conditional probability density and that is the probability density stationary density of the process. Now of course I have discrete values 1 and 2 so each of these is summed over x x1 and x2 and instead of these densities I write down the probabilities themselves. So it is a straightforward calculation you can come complete this fairly straightforwardly let us look at what these probabilities themselves are in the simplest instance. So to make life a little simple let me do the following let us take x2 to be minus x1 so that it is completely symmetrical and let us call this value some constant value c and the other value is minus c etc. minus c so it flips back and forth between plus c and minus c and for algebraic simplicity let us suppose the transition rate is just a constant lambda so this is some tau equal to lambda inverse and this average value is again tau equal to lambda inverse average on either side the average duration in each state is some tau which is the reciprocal of a single common rate of lambda of switching from 1 to 2 and 2 back to 1. So this just becomes this quantity here and then it is easy to compute so 
So, I write P of t once again as equal to e to the w t p of 0 whatever be my initial distribution and what is e to the w t it is this, but this is equal to I need to exponentiate this I find its square and its cube and so on and so forth. So, let me write this as minus lambda times the unit matrix plus lambda times a matrix which is essentially 0 1 1 0. So, this becomes e to the minus lambda t because I have e to the power a matrix plus another matrix and e to the a plus b is not e to the a times e to the b unless a and b commute with each other. But in this case a happens to be the unit matrix which commutes with everything else. So, that is the reason I chose this special case. So, it is e to the minus lambda t and then it is the exponential e to the lambda t times this matrix. 0 1 1 0 the whole thing acts on p of 0. What is the square of this matrix? So, let me call this matrix it is got a name minus lambda i plus lambda let me call this matrix sigma 1 and then notice that when I exponentiate this sigma 1 things are very very simple because what sigma 1 squared it is the unit matrix right. So, this becomes I once again right and what happens next 3 factorial sigma 1 cube but sigma 1 squared is the unit matrix. So, it is just sigma 1 plus dot 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 and I gather all the i's together and I have 1 plus lambda square t squared by 2 factorial plus lambda t to the power 4 over 4 factorial etcetera ad infinitum and what is that equal to. plus I have another matrix which is lambda t plus lambda cube t cube over 3 factorial plus lambda 5 t 5 over 5 factorial plus times sigma 1. So, what is this equal to? Yeah, it is equal to cos hyperbolic lambda t times i plus and this is sin hyperbolic lambda t times sigma 1 and that is it. Therefore, this thing here is now exponentiated it is finished it is equal to e to the minus lambda t times this matrix. So, that matrix is just this cos hyperbolic lambda t sin hyperbolic lambda t on this side sin hyperbolic lambda t cos hyperbolic lambda t it is that matrix acting on p 1 of 0. So, let us write that explicitly p of 0 that is it and you begin to see immediately that it gives you exactly what you would intuitively expect directly. And that is the exact solution to this differential coupled differential equations, which we circumvented by simply writing the matrix solution down right away. And therefore, P1 of t, P2 of t, if I write it as a column vector, this is equal to e to the minus. So, let us uh, let us write this out explicitly. The solution P1 of t is equal to and P2 of t is equal to there is an e to the minus lambda t cos hyperbolic lambda t times p of 0. So, this gives you e to the power minus lambda t 
P1 of 0 plus sin hyperbolic lambda t P2 of 0 and similarly that is it. So, it gives you explicit solutions. If I start with the system in say the upper level then P1 of 0 is 1 and P2 of 0 is 0 what happens as you can see the probabilities flip back and forth. So, if P of 0 is equal to 1 0 then this quantity here becomes equal to this is 0 here. So, it is just this and that is equal to 1 half 1 plus e to the minus 2 lambda t and that is it and in that same case this becomes equal to half this is an e to the minus lambda t. So, this becomes 1 minus e to the minus 2. So, at t equal to 0 this is 0 and that is 1 and as t increases this fellow drops down from a number from 1 towards half asymptotically and this builds up from 0 towards a half pardon me yeah there is a bracket over here right right okay. And what does the correlation function become? What do you think the correlation function would be? And what are the steady state probabilities? What is the equilibrium distribution in this case? Just half and half, it is clear that the number the, the average durations are equal and it is half and half, but that is precisely what you expect this to become as t tends to infinity. Well, that is a check that there is sufficient mixing in the system that the conditional probability tends to the stationary probability as t tends to infinity the memory of the initial condition is gone and that is exactly what has happened here. It is not hard to show that the correlation in this case C of t the average value is 0. So, we do not even have to subtract the average and this quantity is equal to what if the value of the random process is plus C or minus C when I take averages and I multiply the two together and I square it and if I want the correlation function it becomes clearly there is a C squared which appears here C of 0 must be equal to 1 and then it is multiplied by if I compute those averages it just turns out to be e to the minus twice lambda t. It is exponentially correlated with the correlation time which is 1 over 2 lambda in which is 2 lambda inverse. That is the time roughly on which this uh, that is the time scale on which the correlation this, mem this the memory acts and it is not surprising because there is just one time scale in the problem. So, you end up with something which is proportional to lambda inverse here. There are many many processes which are exponentially correlated Markov processes there could be in general more time scales there could be a sum of exponentials but when processes are exponentially correlated with a single correlation time something very special happens and the DMP is a classic instance of such a two level system a two, a two state process. You can add a symmetry to it you can change the rates and so on and so forth but the essential physics does not change very common in modeling very very popular in modeling. It is clear that it may, you know, models something which is either on or off a two state system is either on or off you can make a three state system where it is on or off and then there are quiescent states there are active states and so on those are generalizations of these uh, two state processes ok. We could make things a little more complicated you could say well and this is a very popular process so let me mention that. There is a class of jump processes where you end up with the following situation the variable x takes on a continuous set of values and there is some equilibrium state 
there is some equilibrium distribution P equilibrium of X some equilibrium probability density then in the Markov process for which the transition rate is of this kind this is the transition probability rate or uh, per unit time to go from X prime to X we could model this in the following way we could say well this thing is a rate so there is a time scale lambda inverse sitting there multiplied by something which depends only on the equilibrium or final state distribution. So you could say it does not depend on where you are but it is instantly jumps and with something which is proportional to P equilibrium of X. This too occurs in many physical situations so the jump rate is independent of the initial state depends only on the final state and that too in a manner which is directly proportional to the stationary distribution itself. I urge you to solve the master equation with this assumption this is a normalized density so if you integrate this over all x you assume it to be equal to 1 and then it turns out you can actually solve for the conditional probability density p of x comma t given x naught you can actually solve this exactly and show that the process is exponentially correlated. So it generalizes the idea of this two state process to a continuum of states in a specific direction. So once again I leave you to work this out and find show that the correlation is exponential this is an exponentially decaying correlation. We will again talk about Markov processes we will again talk about similar considerations but let us go now change horses and go completely back to dynamical systems and see how a specific coarse grain dynamics is in fact a Markov process this is what I would like to do and I would like to show you that the dynamics is exactly that of a Markov chain which is the sort of thing we examined here and now just to make things a little less uh, accidentally degenerate let us look at the tent map once again of the unit interval but we will make it an asymmetric tent map just so that we do not have artificial degeneracies and there is a specific reason why I do so. So let us take instead of a tent map which goes up and comes down at a half let us say it goes up in this fashion and comes down there for the rest of it and let us suppose this is some number A which is less than a half so 0 and 1 here and this is unity here and this is my map function so this is how xn plus 1 is given xn. I call this the asymmetric tent map and the map function is the following xn plus 1 is equal to it is clear it is xn divided by a or 0 less than equal to a the slope is 1 over a because it reaches 1 when xn is a and what is the slope here it starts at 1 and goes to 0 and therefore it must be 1 minus x n and the slope is 1 minus a because if a is a half it is also a half it is it's also 2 so a less than equal to x n less than equal to unity okay. now this map is fully chaotic and what I am going to do is to partition it into two cells a left and a right and the natural thing to do is to partition it from 0 to A as one cell and A to 1 as another. So let me call this left and let us call this the right cell and similarly for X and plus 1 okay. what is the invariant density of this system of this map. So we write the Frobenius Perron equation once again I have rho of x equal to integral 0 to 1 dy rho of y a delta function of x minus f of y in this fashion and that is equal to well since I am breaking this map up there is a 0 to a which is one piece and an a to this which is another piece so this is equal to 0 to a 
dy rho of y a delta function of x minus y over a because that is what the map function is this region and then a piece which is a to 1 dy rho of y a delta function of x minus 1 minus y over 1 minus a that is the Frobenius Bernoulli equation and in the standard procedure we convert this to a functional equation and see if we can guess a solution to this equation. So I pull out this a y becomes a x so it is rho of a x but if I pull out this a from the denominator it goes up here in the numerator there and similarly plus 1 minus a this factor comes up and then a rho of now y here is equal to so 1 minus y becomes equal to 1 minus a times x so y becomes equal to 1 minus 1 minus a x so this argument is 1 minus 1 minus a times x that is the Frobenius Perot equation. What is the guess solution? Yeah, the fact that this and that <laughs> seem to cancel each other suggests that you put rho equal to a constant again. So, yes, indeed, this is true. Rho of x equal to 1 is the unique normalizable non negative solution to this equation. So, it is a uniform density once again, it does not matter whether it is a symmetric tent map or asymmetric it is uniformly spread out. Now I am going to do the following I am going to ask what is the transition matrix to go from one cell to another we write this w down completely for this chain and then we test if this is a Markov process or not by finding out whether the two step probabilities is just the square of the same matrix which you get in the one step if it is we know that it is a Markov process or the n step probability is just some mat transition matrix raised to the n if so if that is computable on both sides and you verify that this is so then it is as good as a Markov process but we need several steps to do this and let us do that carefully first let us ask what is the so my cells are here and this by the way is a also so this is cell left here and that is right here and this is left here and right here for the one step transition okay. first I ask what is the ma measure of the left cell what is this equal to that is clear clearly an integral over the left cell which is 0 to a dx rho of x that is obvious that is the definition of the invariant measure just the integral of the invariant density over the cell okay. and since this is constant equal to 1 this is a and mu right equal to 1 minus a so that is certainly true right. I need to calculate the transition probabilities so I need to calculate quantities like the probability that if I start at 0 at time 0 in the left cell I am at so L at time 0 I remain in the cell L at time 0 I need to compute this number hmm? that is a probability pardon me at time 1 at time 1 at the end of one time step so let us put the time steps here. Similarly, I need to calculate P L 1 given that I start at R on the right hand side or P R 1 given that I start at L 0 and P R 1 given that I start at R 0. I need to calculate these probabilities and then I am going to put that in the form of a matrix I'll call that my transition matrix at each step. Now how do you define these quantities what would you do remember that the x itself is continuous 
but I have broken up the whole thing into cells and I am now looking at the symbolic dynamics of the cells. So, the states of my system are either L and R, R, L and, R and that is what I have written here these are the probabilities I am computing, but how do I write this down for example, how would I write this down what would be the procedure to write this down from first principles I would like to know what is P at L1 at L0 I have to be a little careful now. So, I ask I say well what is the joint probability that I am at in the left cell at time 1 given that I am in the left cell at time 0. So, I start with this quantity here and ask what is this joint probability and this as you will see intuitively is equal to an integral over dx0 suppose x has the value x0 at 0 time. So, it is an integral over dx0 over the L cell an integral over dx1 over the left cell multiplied by multiplied by what since x is continuous we are talking about probability densities right. So, this is multiplied by the probability invariant probability that you are in the cell L you you have the invariant probability for this variable x0 rho of x0 integrated over L that gives you the probability of starting in L multiplied by the probability density for starting at x0 and moving to an x1 and that we know is a delta function kernel and we know that that is equal to this this is a conditional probability density it says if you give me an x0 I am guaranteed to go to an x1 whose density is given by this and that multiplied by rho of x0 gives me the joint probability density for x0 and x1 x0 at time 0 and x1 at time 1 and it is integrated over x0 and x1 over the regions that you are interested in. So, this is in fact the definition of this joint probability right, but what is that equal to what is this equal to well x0 L the cells L is just 0 to A dx0 and it is just 0 to A once again over dx1 on this side and rho of x0 for this map is 1. So, you do not need to put that in, but you do need to put in delta of x1 minus f of x0 this function and this function was what x over a. So, so, so it is x0 over a because that is what the branch on the left is. So, delta of x1 of x0 over a okay. I need to compute this integral. So, the range of integration the region of integration you can do this geometrically in the following way one way would be to convert this to an integral delta function over x0 finish that and then do the x1 integration, but I can do it as it is because I also have to integrate over x1 I may as well do it directly provided the delta function fires and when will that happen here is the region of integration this square and here is the delta function constraint which tells you that x1 is f of a f of x0. So, what is the value of this integral hmm? no what is the value of this integral of course, it does for all x0 between 0 to this point wherever this intercept is for every x1 in this region of integration between 0 to a that delta function fires. So, I can do the x1 integration provided I restrict the x0 integration to this region otherwise the delta function does not contribute and what is this point this value here 
it is a squared it is a squared because a squared over a will give you this value a. So this integral becomes equal to 0 to a squared dx naught and now the delta function has taken care of has become 1 because this integral is finished here and the answer is a squared right therefore what is this equal to that is the conditional then say probability for this l to l exactly so it must be this quantity is this quantity multiplied by p of l0 is by definition equal to p of l1 l0 the joint probability is the conditional probability multiplied by the absolute probability here therefore this quantity alone is this divided by p of l0 but that is equal to a squared divided by what is this equal to p of l0 yeah it is the invariant measure because it says what is the actual stationary probability of being in l I close my eyes and put my finger on this uh, on uh, uh, this interval and what is the probability I am here or there and it is just mu l which is equal to so we have an A here what is this going to be well let us do that let us see what that thing is so again it is over L dx naught but this becomes an R and now I am trying to compute P of R1 so this is finished. this is over r and I have to do this integral and what does that become I use the same strategy as before in this case since the invariant measure is unity it is actually very simple I have to integrate over this quantity here dx0 over L but dx1 I integrate over r so really it is this range of integration that I am talking about and this range of integration for every value of x1 I have a contribution from the delta function provided x0 runs from here to there and therefore this is equal to integral and that runs from a squared to a from here to there dx0 and then the delta function contribution over x1 gives you unity for the x1 integration. so it is a times 1 minus a so this guy gives you a times 1 minus a but then I must divide in order to get this conditional probability I must divide by the measure of this cell here <coughs> mu of l which is an a and therefore this just gives me 1 minus a similarly for the other one p of l1 r0 I have to integrate over this rectangle and the contribution that is non that is non trivial the only contribution comes from this region now what is this point remember this function is 1 minus x0 so this is x0 here and this is x1 it is 1 minus x0 over 1 minus a and that is equal to a because that is the value here so it tells you 1 minus x0 equal to a minus a squared or x0 is equal to 1 minus a plus a squared so this point is 1 minus a plus a squared. therefore if I integrate uh, we are now doing 
L 1 and R 0. So, this is over R, this is over L and that integral is this interval and it is 1 minus this guy. So, it is A minus A squared is A times 1 minus A. So, this quantity here is A times 1 minus A, but then I need to divide by the measure of this cell to get the conditional probability and that is a 1 minus A and therefore, it is just A. And finally, we need to know this length and divide by the measure of the right cell because we are now integrating over this region and that length is 1 minus a plus a squared minus a it is 1 minus a the whole squared divided by 1 minus a to get the conditional probability just gives me a 1 minus a. So, this here is an a and a 1 minus a on this side. The sum over each column is 1 therefore, it is a stochastic matrix a matrix with non negative elements such that each column adds up to 1 or each row adds up to 1 is called a stochastic matrix because it is connected to these probabilities and such a matrix would have a uniform left eigen vector had the sum row sums been equal to 1 it would have a uniform column vector as the eigen vector. So, it clearly has 1 as an eigen value and a uniform left eigen vector and the corresponding right eigen vector is not hard to find it would be related to some equilibrium distribution in this case it would be related to a and 1 minus a itself. So, this gives me my transitions here, the transition at one time step and the question is is can the transition matrix at two time steps be written as the square of the transition matrix over one time step. So, if I call this some transition matrix T it is related to the W that I wrote down earlier by the addition of a unit matrix here then the question is what is T squared and is that the same as so the question we ask is the following is and I leave you to verify this is the matrix P of L at time 2 given L at 0. is this matrix equal to T squared is the question. If it is then you have reason to believe that this is a Markov chain because all you are doing is to take this transition matrix one step transition matrix and multiplying it raising it to higher and higher powers. Now, what would you do to compute this? Yeah, what I do is to first compute this L 2 L 0 and I write this as over L d x naught let us just call it all right x naught over L d x 2 times rho of x naught which is a unit a unity in this case multiplied by a delta function of x 2 minus f 2 of x naught. So, I take the second iterate of this map and play the same game and compute these numbers which are very easy to do in this case and check out whether that is equal to the square of this guy or not of this matrix here. If so then by iteration by induction I know that this is true in the nth step as well. I leave you to verify that this is indeed so this A is a Markov chain which is equivalent to saying that this partitioning that we have done of the phase space in this map is a Markov partition 
because the symbolic dynamics of the system has been reduced to a Markov chain in discrete time. And therefore, I can use the entire machinery of Markov chains to solve various problems here. For instance, I could ask questions like if I start with the cell L, then what is the mean time for me to come back to the cell L? Because it undergoes excursions from L to R, it stays in L for a while, etc. So, if it leaves L after a time step, what is the mean time for it to come back? What is the statistics of these recurrence times and so on? So, the entire machinery of Markov chains for which well defined answers exist for such questions can be used in order to study the dynamics of the system. You do not have to go back to the map anymore because that dynamics has been now transferred to the properties of this Markov chain. It carries all the information that you need this, uh, this, uh, this transition matrix already carries everything. So, we will study this a little better because I would like to do two things. I would like to show you that there is a uniform there is a, a very specific behavior of the recurrent statistics namely when the system comes back because it is ergodic you know that the system will come back to whichever cell you leave given enough time. Then a question of interest is how long does it take to come back? What is the statistics of the recurrences? Are the successive recurrences independent of each other or not and so on? Well defined answers to these exist and we will use this as a sort of case history to study this little deeper and I will do that next time stop here today.